Welcome. I'm Ed Steinfeld, Director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Welcome to this special book talk on Angronomics, a new and really timely work by uh, my friend and colleague Mark Blythe and his co-author Eric Lonergan. We're joined here today by Mark, who is the Director of the Watson Institute's William R. Rhodes Center for International Economics and Finance. And Mark is also the William R. Rhodes Professor of International Economics and Professor of Political Science and International and Public Affairs. Mark and I are going to chat for 20 or 25 minutes or so, but then we would love to take questions from you all in the audience. In fact, if you have a lot of questions, we'll cut our chat shorter and we'll go right to your questions. Uh, for those of you joining us via Zoom, it would be great if you could write your questions in the Q&A box, in the Q&A window, and we'll monitor those. And for those of you joining via YouTube Live, just write your questions in the comments section. Those questions will, will get to us. And please start writing those questions now, especially if you've uh, already had the uh, pleasure and privilege of reading Angronomics. So Mark, let's, uh, let's get started. I, I love this book. It's really um, it's provocative and fascinating. You mention in um, in the book that the the work is intended to restore economics over angrynomics. W what does that mean, really? All right. So there's a great quote from John Maynard Keynes that his lifetime ambition was to turn economics into dentistry, and what he meant by that was that we'd actually figure out how the world works to such a thing that basically it's like a root canal. You need a root canal, but painful, you fix it, right? Nothing special, nothing spectacular. It becomes part of the process. In a sense, it's a desire to engineer the world in that way. And that would be nice if we could get to that world. There's real limits on whether you can really do that or not. But what we've got instead is a world that seems to be making more and more people angry for a variety of different reasons. And the motivation for the book very simply is, on average, the world's never been richer. We, we have more resources. We should be able to do more things. And yet, at the same time, we've seen people becoming very angry over, let's just do America over the past decade or so, the Tea Party. Then after the Tea Party, we begin to have the first version of Black Lives Matter and racial protests. Then we come out of that and we get into the lockdown protests over COVID. Then we have more racial strife. Put this in a global context, indignados in Spain, anti-inequality in Chile, the Hong Kong's democracy protesters, Gilets jaunes in France, the complete breakdown of many European party systems and the death of centre parties, the rise of populism, Trump, Brexit, the Scottish referendum, all of that is coming out despite us never being richer. So our challenge was to try and say why we think this is happening and ultimately what we can do about it. But in this distinction between angrynomics versus economics, is the we know there's a lot of angriness out there, but is the point that anger is motivating people to behave in ways that aren't economically sound? I mean, why the angrynomics? How has anger changed what we understand to be economics? So the way that we talk about this in the book, we put the anger frame at the front, we can talk about that. But the middle of the book basically talks about macro-angrynomics. And what do we mean by this? There's an analogy we use in the book, which is imagine sort of capitalist economies to be like computers. Now, all laptops, when you break them open, are basically the same. They have the same components, but they're arranged in different ways, kind of like countries. Every country has a capital market. Everybody has a labor market, but they're very different from each other. And the way that you get these things to work, there are certain economic ideas which run on that hardware. And over time, what happens is they accumulate bugs in the software and they lead to crashes. When you have those crashes, that's when people get annoyed. It's just like when your computer crashes, you get very angry because you can't do your work anymore. When the economy crashes, both on a macro and a micro level, that creates these outpourings of anger. And what we do is we try and trace through the middle of the book on a macro level and a micro level, what are the stressors that produce these anger. But just to, to dial it back and get into the basics of it, we define macro, uh, we define angrynomics as the condition that pertains when the economy stops serving or is perceived to stop serving the interests of the majority of citizens who constitute it. And that seems to be the feeling that is stripped right across the OECD countries and other countries, that in a sense it's a rigged game. That basically there's a bunch of insiders, variously called elites or cosmopolitans, who've made off with all the cash and all the advantage, sequestered those monopoly advantages for themselves, and everyone else is working harder and harder for less and less. And that's basically what we want to tap into and to take that seriously, 
And the anger frame is a way of trying to make sense of the different types of anger expression we see. Yeah, the way I understood the book was crises are important. There are moments at which these systems break down, but there's actually, there's something much more long-term about the nature of anger that builds up. So the way I read it, the way I read your argument was to say that over long periods of time, a, a kind of a disconnect happens. On the one hand, there are these experts who push certain kinds of paradigms, frameworks for understanding the way the world works. We all have to have frameworks. So there's these dominant paradigms. And I think your point is, correct me if I'm wrong, is at least on at one level, sometimes those paradigms, as smart as the experts are or think they are, the paradigms are just wrong. And, and ordinary people know that. They Ordinary people hear this stuff about paradigms, but say, that's BS. That yeah. just isn't right. That's one thing. But you, know, you could view that as just expert hubris. And, but then there's this other thing you and Eric refer to, which is just out and out self-dealing by elites, people in power, whether financially or politically. And tell me a little bit about how I'm supposed to make sense of those long-term trends of just bad ideas that the mm -hmm. experts aren't smart enough to figure out versus just self-dealing elites. So, so why choose? Let's have both simultaneously, or at least you could have environments in which one allows the other to come to prominence, which is, I think, where we are at the moment, unfortunately. So take the first one. I'm not sure it's a case of they're not smart enough to understand it. The way that we try and think about it, and this is, I'm interested that you're pulling that reading out because we hint at this, but don't really explicitly say it, is we tend to think about it this way. Our theories about the world, our software for running the economy, if you want to put it this way, it's kind of fixed in a moment in time, usually after a moment of crisis. So for example, the 70s is a big crisis of inflation. All of the ideas that come out in the 1980s are about independent central banks, the importance of price stability, it's all reflected in that moment. But we now live in a world in which we haven't had inflation for 20 years. The only, only inflation we see is in asset prices. So to what extent can those theories still run the hardware without it basically suffering incompatibilities? So it's more like the world evolves and changes, but the code instructions stay the same, and that's going to create problems. Now, in terms of the, you know, the self-dealing of this, this goes back to the fact that if anger is released in the system, if it's kind of like a volatility constraint and it blows off, then who, in a sense, gets to weaponize that anger? What's the point of it? And we live in a particular moment where a convergence of digital and other media technologies and the end of the old established media monopolies has created space for political entrepreneurs to really go in and weaponize this in a way that we haven't seen before. Now we could talk about Trump and Twitter, but the original example of this is Silvio Berlusconi, who basically takes over Italy because he runs all the media in Italy, right? So those types of dynamics, when you have a system whereby the OS, if you will, is no longer really running as it should, and ordinary people are on the ground are saying, well, you know, you're telling me there's no inflation, but how come the cost of everything that I care about, housing, uh, college, healthcare is going up? How can there be no inflation? Well, they're quite right. Their lived experience of the metric of the expert, they're totally different things. That results in a loss of credibility. At the same time, you have this kind of weaponization of politics, which is possible now in a way it wasn't before, which then feeds back and stokes that anger further. So in a sense, why choose? The two of them are kind of working pari passu in that one. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. But let me push a little bit more on why I think it, it is important to choose a little bit, even though these are totally intertwined. I think about myself, you know, in the 1980s, 90s, I took Econ 101. And, you know, I, we grew up in a neoliberal moment. <laughs> and what, regardless of my political views, I guess I nodded accordingly when I was told markets are the most equitable, efficient way of allocating resources and all ships will rise with the rising tide and better to deregulate and globalization is good. You know, I think one can intellectually say, fine, those are good ideas. And, you know, we all nodded. And all the while that was going on, there's all this other evidence, at least about the process, you know, mm -hmm. wage stagnation in the middle and all these people suffering. And I guess I heard that, but still I could nod as a, you know, whatever expert. Yeah. yeah and say, in the end, it's all going to work out. And maybe I'm an idiot, but okay, that's a mistake of hubris. And then the idea is, well, we need new paradigms, maybe new people, but that's, you could see change coming through better ideas, but if fundamentally the problem is like the norms of leadership have just 
on the left and right have been tossed and it's all about self dealing now that's a that's a different kind of problem I mean, that calls for that's that's revolution that's regime change that's that's man the barricades rather than right write a different textbook. And I know they're intertwined, but wh which one is really the issue today? Well, if we think about the uh, protests going on just now, if you will, the, the second wave of Black Lives Matter and the protest group in the US, these are clear claims to moral outrage. These are clear claims to you are self-dealing, you are hypocrites, you do not actually apply the law equally. Right? That's exactly that kind of revolutionary situation. But I think it varies by you know, area in this regard. I think another way of putting it, rather than the sort of the hubris on one side and then the self-dealing on the other side, is simply the fact that as the world has become more integrated and globalized and all those things that we grew up with, it's a natural human tendency for us to discount information that doesn't go with our priors. We see this in politics, but we also see it in economics and everything else. If you grew up believing free trade is good for you, you will defend that argument, even if there's lots of evidence coming the other way. And I still defend parts of that argument. It doesn't mean the whole thing is wrong, right? So it takes a, I'll throw another Keynes quote at you. The problem is not so much the lack of new ideas, it's the trouble of escaping from old ones. Sure. And, and that lag effect, I think, combines with the real issues of self-dealing and then basically, you know, in a sense, the software no longer matching the hardware to produce a world in which you get a lot of uncertainty and that leads towards the type of dynamics we see with angry nomics. Okay, so let me restate it to make sure I've got it. The idea is there are a bunch of bad ideas out there, ideas that have obsolesced before people in power recognize that. And because they're slow to respond, that creates this opening for, you know, in your words, tribal identity and tr tribalism and that kind of anger to be used as a technology that these, that some people will weaponize this yeah. while the experts are slow to respond. You get the, you know, you name it, the Berlusconi's, the Trumps are, who weaponize this stuff and you get the moment we're in today. Yes, but it's not just manufactured in the sense that it is actually real things that people are responding to. I mean, I'll give you an example of this. So, and also how it's weaponized. So if you watch American media, let's use that horrible term, the mainstream media. Sure. When they had the lockdown protest, you bet everybody in the world saw the half a dozen people or a dozen people that turned up was the militia, right? Very few of us saw the picture of the 2,000 people who were also there without guns, who were essentially saying what we say all the time, but kind of feed, feed out. So there was a Federal Reserve study a few years back that said that 40% of Americans, could be even more actually, would have trouble getting 400 bucks together in an emergency. Well, at the time of the Michigan lockdown protest, that emergency started two months ago and the checks hadn't arrived yet. Meanwhile, they're watching the television and they're saying that the Federal Reserve has basically said, if you're rich and you have assets, don't worry, we'll buy everything. Now that disconnect, you don't have to have a higher degree in economics to understand who's got the airbag and who doesn't, right? And who has insurance and who doesn't and who's paying the costs and who doesn't. And that's what's real, and that is what's being partially weaponized. But we also want to acknowledge that this is absolutely legitimate. And the fact that folks like you and I have been tone deaf for so long is a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm the first to admit I've been tone deaf. But at the same time, you know, in, in 2009, during the financial crisis, again, regardless of my political views, it made me crazy that in the early part of the first Obama administration, it seemed that nothing was being done punitively against the banks or the bankers, or that when big bonuses were paid out, nothing happened, you know, yeah. nothing punitive. And it made me nuts with, with, with anger or moral indignation. So it, it does seem to me that this is a fairly extended long-term oh, yeah. process. Absolutely. And, you know, people pick up little bits of different parts of the information and interpret it in different ways. I mean, you could say that, for example, Obama's response and the response of that administration, a new administration coming to power, not the establishment Democrats, correctly turned to the poachers, turned gamekeepers, the summers and others, the ones who built the system to try and bail the system. Well, you end up in a world which basically the old mantra was bail, fail and send to jail. And what we did was bail, nobody failed and absolutely nobody went to jail. I don't think that Obama thought, let's make that the policy target. But that's the way it ended up. And that then sent a signal to people that basically there's two sets of rules. If I'm a small businessman, I go to the wall. If I'm a big bank, I get taxpayer bailouts. What's that socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor, which 
is essentially the system we've been running for the past decade and a half. Right. I mean, I, I don't know how deeply we would want to go into this, but also race is, is in the American story, although arguably in some of the other national contexts too, race then suffuses a lot of this discussion about um, or involving rage and anger and Absolutely. moral indignation, but also um, access to, to, to prosperity. Yeah, th these, th these things are interrelated. I mean, I, I would never be foolish enough to reduce race to economics. I think it's absolutely ridiculous, particularly in the context of the United States. It has its own history. It has its own, uh, its own, its own uh, drivers. But I'll give you one example, something I posted last week. About two weeks ago, the Boston Federal Reserve issued a study, and it looked at net family wealth, right, or basically net sort of assets versus liabilities for families in Boston. Now, your average white family, and think about this as a misleading average because you've got a bunch of super rich people in, our, in Boston, so it pushes it up a bit, right? But you're actually median, I should say. But your, your middle family income in, in Boston uh, essentially is $247,000 a year. Your black family in Boston is eight bucks. Let me say that again, eight dollars, right? You do not get those types of inequalities unless you have serious institutions pushing things in this direction for many years at a time, redlining in property, access to credit, unable to access the financial system. Policing is just one part of that set of institutions. So of course, this is tied into it in the particular form of anger and moral outrage, which I think is utterly justified in the United States today, is what we see in the current protests. It's, you know, I, in, in the book, you and Eric have a number of very interesting proposals um, I guess we'll call them policy proposals for national wealth funds, dual interest rates, direct transfers, direct governmental transfers to household income, which I, I think are, are quite novel and, and um, provocative and persuasive in many respects. But how would that then play out against what you just said? So, you know, we've seen the New Deal and the New Great Society. We've had pushes like this, which then again, get filtered through race and other kinds of biases that still lead to important parts of the population not benefiting. Is there some oh, way that these new proposals could, could get around that? So what we tried to do was to take that into account and think, who is this book for, right? And this book is for basically everybody who's interested in this question. And it's written as a dialogue because the way that we wrote the book, I, I don't know if I told you this, was we basically recorded it on Siri. We used a couple of phones and Eric did a bunch of reading, I did a bunch of reading, and then we talked the book. We then got Siri to transcribe it. Now with an Irishman and a Scotsman talking, Siri had a very hard time, but we put it into normal text. And when we put it in normal text, it was horrible. It sounded like two rich white guys telling everybody that they've got all the solutions and we know what's going on and all you need to do is a couple of technocratic fixes and that's it. So we hated it. So we put it back into a dialogue format and really tried to open it up and detechnify it and get rid of all that sort of stuff. But we still ended up with these proposals, which are kind of techie and inside our belt with negative interest rates, dual interest rates. Why? Partly, I'll, oh, I'll Eric. say they're, ex they're accessible, though, which is it's, Yeah, we do try and explain it. Partly, I'll blame Eric because he's just a monetary policy geek, right? But the other side of it is, and this is the serious point, if you say Green New Deal to people, about 30% of the country switches off. Just the very term New Deal is itself politically toxic. It also says something about the lack of sort of bipartisanship and also genuine new ideas that can reach across political divides, which are very real in the United States, that the last good thing the Democrats can point to happened 80 years ago. Now, I think the case for decarbonization, as I call it, is overwhelming, but if you're gonna basically say New Deal, it throws up all these things and it's dead before it starts. So in a sense, our attempt to do this is to describe in a neutral thing as possible, Policies which are basically not based on increasing taxation that make a real difference to the assets that, un that people who don't have assets could accrue over a lifetime, if not shorter period of time, that could make serious dents in inequality, but also are likely to get people on the left and the right to say, yeah, you know, shorter revolution, that's not bad. So, you know, that's why we ended up with those ones in particular. Because unless you're actually arguing things that aren't going to inflame tensions before people even start listening to them, there's no point in saying them. Yeah, I, and we'll get into, I hope, some of the details about the, some of the proposals, and I'm sure the audience will have questions about it. But I want to explore a little bit how these 
proposals, again, whether it's for dual interest rates or national wealth fund, um, direct transfers to, to, to household income, how do those translate into really a new kind of politics? And I guess some of this may have to do with what our idea of politics is, but I, I suppose one view is people vote their pocketbooks, which is plausible, mm -hmm. but I, maybe a different view is that people want to feel something. They, they want yeah. their dignity reaffirmed. You know, I want to feel something. And uh, yeah, nobody's what wanting the bargain with yeah. real interest rates. I totally get that, right? Nobody's yeah, so, wanting the bargain, yeah. And your point, if I've got it right, is look, you know, we're locked into this politics of either these techie answers, which people don't want to hear, or, you know, vague, empty slogans versus the raw meat of, negative, zero-sum, xenophobic identity, and none of those is good. So what is the, what is the kind of new politics that's going to reshape the fissures that are currently existing in so many societies? Well, let's give the example of why we like national wealth funds to try and talk this through, right? Yeah. So people have heard of sovereign wealth funds, and they think of Norway has all this oil, it gets all these dollars, what are we going to do with them? We don't use dollars, we buy assets, we put them in a fund. Makes Norway the richest country in the world. Now, without getting too much into the sort of the technical side of this, if you invest in stocks, over the long run, they yield 6% a year, more or less. If you invest in bonds, now they're negative. So why would you ever buy bonds? Well, every time there's a financial crisis, the government's cost of capital goes negative because people want to buy bonds and they dump all their equities. Why don't we, rather than private equity, just issue more bonds because people want them and they're negative, buy up all those assets and put them in a completely passive fund miles away from the politicians. And then literally over 10 years, if you did that with 20% of US GDP and you bought up those assets, you would have a multi-trillion dollar wealth fund, which you could then give to people for college, you could do it for reforming healthcare, you could really make a difference in the things that actually make a difference in people's lives. And that's the type of thing, because it's capital friendly, because it's actually doing what the Fed does in a sense, but without doing it in such a way that only existing asset holders actually benefit, then over, you gotta think multiple electoral cycles, you're creating an institution which has bipartisan support. That's how you engender a politics, because you've got things that people can basically see as real assets. They matter to the pocketbook, but they become valued in and of themselves. So it's an attempt to build things and make a difference that last more than six months or blow up the minute the electoral cycle goes. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I guess if, if there are these kinds of transfers, we won't even call them transfers, but, but if there's, there's, there's new wealth being generated, um, through investment and money is being allocated, I would think that if there's a sense of solidarity in society, mm -hmm. a sense, then see, as a citizen, I would feel this is great. I'm really happy that this is happening. If there's, if there are these tribal identities, though, I might say, well, that poor guy, you know, he, she's lazy. Why is that person? Or, you know, that welfare mom, which is, of course, you know, racialized when it was deployed in earlier American politics. How do we, to what extent are the proposals vulnerable to, to, the, to the kind of angry attitudes yeah. or the tribal attitudes you said versus what I would hope for is a more solidarity, solidaristic take on citizenship? Well, the thing, the key word there is citizen, because, you know, part of the problem is over the past 30 years, that concept has been emptied of all value. You're essentially a consumer rather than you are a citizen. And to re-enrich that, I think you need to give people a stake in their society, which is also something else which has been eviscerated. And the politics that you're talking about exactly would weaponize that away. But let's do a counterfactual. When was it right across the OECD that these types of reactionary uh, protest movements, the exclusionary zero-sum ones, really were in abeyance. They were in abeyance in the mid to late 90s, basically 94 to 2000. They were all falling down. Berlusconi was literally the only one. And all he was really doing was Italians to not pay their taxes because he didn't pay taxes. There was very little going on apart from that. What was going on? Real wages were rising. Right? For the first time in a decade, real wages are rising. When you actually change the amount of money in people's pockets, it works wonders. It's not the only thing that's going on. 
But if you could basically, to go back to that earlier example, if you could take African-American families in Boston and just radically change, forget community banking and uh, regulations, et cetera, really change the asset balance in Boston society, make the houses that they're able to buy the ones that you can then lend against, borrow against, really change the assets in society. Yes, some people will definitely feel that that is against their interest. But the majority of us will benefit from the fact that it's actually leading to a better, more prosperous and just society. And I'm, what I see now when I look at the opinion polls around the uh, Black Lives Matter resurgence in the protests just now is I'm really heartened because it really seems that the United States public, is, 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 whether it's the combination of body cam footage on YouTube, what you actually see police doing in protests, etc. But you saw the opinion polls move, right? The majority is now with the protesters. And that's almost like a structural shift. You're not putting this one back in the box. And I think that you can do that. You can have these types of policies and institutions and moments that change the conversation, that change the way that we think about these things. And I think that that's, we're, we're really interesting in that moment just now, particularly as regards race in the United States. But as I say, that is tied up in a whole set of questions about economics and equity and access and justice and dignity. Yeah, I mean, I... I agree, and I hope you could tell. I hope you could tell, and I hope the audience could tell that this this book got me thinking. It's really a great uh, read. Uh, we have a lot of questions from the audience, so let's let's turn to them if that's okay with you. Um, let me start with a, a question from Chris Harding. And Chris asks, "Do you, like Ray Dalio, see a bigger seventy-five year, hundred, five hundred year cycle going on here? Or are we living at a time when we're?" do from massive reset because the paradigms have revealed their limitations. I agree with a lot of part of that and I haven't read Ray's book, but I do get very suspicious when astonishingly rich people suddenly declare themselves expert economic historians and start declaring huge things about cycles in the world. Um, I can draw, I can draw any, any color of line you want through any type of data set if there's enough data there. So I'm a little bit skeptical of the cyclical stuff. But I think that what Ray's getting at, as one of the richest people around, is that there are limits to how much few, a few at the top can take. I, I don't read these interventions as analyses of the world. I read them as kind of mea culpas for what we've done. And if you look at what the Business Roundtable did regarding shareholder value, if you look at Ray and other big senior hedges' de declarations on inequality reaching its limits and all this sort of stuff, I think that this is a recognition that the system is bust and that we want to edge towards a solution because they understand that angrynomics, in a sense, is the normal and their wealth gathering strategies simply can't survive it. Makes sense. Um, I was going to follow up, but I'm going to, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you got me going now, but I'm going to shut up and, and, and let the audience talk. So, uh, Barbara Stallings asks, what's the trajectory from Austerity, your previous book, Austerity to Angronomics, is the change due to exogenous factors or endogenous? In either case, what are the most important factors that led you from writing the previous book to this book? Oh, well, thank you, Barbara. Great question. Um, I would say everything ultimately is endogenous. Most of what we think is outside coming in. You know, the financial crisis was endogenous to the balance sheets of dodgy banks, right? So it wasn't an exogenous shock. In that sense, it's basically been the failure to change the business model that led to the crash of 2008. We kept, we patched the software, we kept the same hardware, we didn't really change anything. And, and then we basically said, everything's fine, don't worry, we'll do a bit of belt tightening, we'll have some austerity, and then it'll be fine. And it wasn't fine. And basically, quantitative easing and other such policies worsened the inequality because essentially the people who were still getting returns were the ones that have assets, the top 20% and above. So when we started to see the anger, the outpour, I did a piece a few years ago for Foreign Affairs called Global, Global Trumpism that basically started to identify this. This is, in a sense, the, the working out of the sort of the, the global Trumpism moment, if you want to put it that way. So that's the trajectory between the two. Excellent. Uh, Sana Vershuren asks a question, uh, a rather broad question. She says, whether and under which conditions can anger be productive? Oh, that's a good one. So we make a distinction in the book between anger as uh, kind of tribal energy that can be weaponized, right? And our example from this came from doing an IBM Watson big data analysis of news reports talking about anger. The one thing that came up all the time was sports fans. 
So what do sports fans do? If you actually look at sports fans, they spend most of their time being angry against other fans for being insufficiently loyal. So it's a kind of in-group solidarity. That tends to be a response in the wider world to a sense of increased uncertainty. So if you think about you know, the micro stressors here, the gig economy, zero hours contracts, think about the fact that 80 million Americans work on at-will contracts on hourly, on our paid hourly, with no statutory sick pay and very, very few rights. That's where the brunt of the COVID shock is going to be, right? So that's where you see anger generated. Now, what makes it good or bad? Well, think about when you have the other side of anger, which we define as basically moral outrage. That's the signal to be listened to. So do you think that, you know, we should listen to, you know, hedge funds screaming about the fact that the value of their assets are going down or airlines who spend it all on buybacks when they basically should have cash reserves? Well, that, that's, that's nonsense, right? And that makes people angry. But the real signal is why do we have a huge part of our labor market with so few protections? If those people are angry, then that's something that you should listen to. So the, the, an example we use in the book is Iceland. Iceland, 1,000% debt to GDP, huge financial crisis, people were angry. But what really got them angry was years later when they found out that their entire elite was banking offshore in the Panama Papers. That's when they got angry. That was the signal for we need to fundamentally change. So it's how you modulate what anger is telling you. We try and make this distinction between moral outrage versus sort of the tribalism, which is in-group norm regulation. And, you know, that, that's how we play it out in the book. Seems that um, successful political leaders they navigate their way through different kinds of anger. Or I'm thinking of, say, Ronald Reagan, the Reagan Revolution. So he gets a bunch of people to vote seemingly, seemingly against their economic interests by hitting their by 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 accessing their anger about the state and an overly intrusive state or by accessing their attitudes about race you know and we yeah. could argue about what what he, but you know he's he's tapping one kind of anger in order to, to create a revolution and bill clinton and you know you could you could trace it along meanwhile in doing that in, in effectively tapping that anger conditions are created by which new kinds of anger are generated. Yeah. So is that the kind of the right way to yeah, think about that? I, th I think that's exactly it. Whereas, you know, if you look at less angry societies, right? Well, you know, who would, who would that be? Well, they tend to be kind of more equalitarian, not to fetishize income inequality is the only thing, but also equality across business, right? So the really interesting work now by David Otter and others uh, that looks at profit dispersal, not just wage dispersal, right? You find that very few firms actually earn any cash, right? Really make profit. And they absolutely dominate the stock market and it's the fangs just now and all this sort of stuff. And everyone else is in the tail and a huge number of firms basically, you're better off buying one month treasury bills than invested in these firms. So there's enormous inequality amongst business themselves as well, as well as those income inequalities. And all of these things compound the sense of sort of um, a lack of control, a lack of ability to set the terms of your own employment or the precariousness of your own investments. Meanwhile, this perception quite correct that the top 20% are making 80% of the cash, right? So that seems to us to be the fundamental driver of this. And it's not just about income inequality, it's inequality amongst businesses and inequality amongst races. It's all compounding in that sense. Yeah. Um, let's, let's go to a question from Douglas Kaminsky. Uh, he writes, did you address the effect of campaign contributions and what policies get enacted and, and the rigging of the system? So, you know, broadly, if, if you have self-dealing people in positions of power, how do you get them out of power? How do you constrain them? We do not address that. Essentially, what we're trying to do in a very short book is set up as a couple of dialogues between basically an academic and a hedge fund manager, but a nice one is essentially, you know, what we think went wrong, what's been generated and what went wrong and what to do with it. This is one part of it, which is particularly germane to the United States, but I really don't address that. And I, I don't want to start talking about it because it's really not my field. There is a, a related question about the um, intellectual relationship or differences between you and Eric. So a, a, an audience member uh, from YouTube writes, apart from quibbles over precise metrics, what are the biggest differences between you, Mark, and Eric with respect to solutions to the, the accumulated bugs of capitalism? Do you guys, are you guys on the same track or different? 
we're broadly on the same track and there's more going on. Maybe that's the edit, the way it came out. It just seems that we care about measuring things in different ways, etc. Is that Eric thinks the inequalities that I've just been talking about are fundamentally important. But he also thinks there's a whole bunch of other things going on that are very important as well. And I'm sympathetic to that, but basically I'm a sort of hit one nail on the head at a time guy. So that's basically where that comes out. Uh, one of the things that Eric is very interested in, which I've kind of alluded to, is concentration. And this is something that we see, you know, Elizabeth Warren's campaign was very much about this. That basically you're seeing consolidation of firms right across the board, which leads to much lower levels of competition, which leads to price fixing, lower investment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of which are deleterious to the consumer who's already sort of strapped, cash strapped, too much credit, too much debt, et cetera, et cetera. So Eric's, one of his takes, he would say, well, you know, I would switch it from the focus on income inequality and even profit distribution and just look at the way that corporate governance works. So I think big buybacks are a big deal. He totally doesn't. Not because they're not bad, but because if you change the rules on buybacks, next week corporate America will figure out a new way, quite legally, of hoovering billions out the door. So if you just focus on that, rather than the bigger problem of corporate governance, you're kind of missing the trick. So that's the way in which we disagree. Would it be, I'm, I'm wondering, it, it, would it be fair for me to say that you're focused more on the issue of fairness rather than um, egalitarianism? per se? I mean, where, or more generally, where does fairness come into the discussion as opposed I'd actually, to I'd equality? Actually flip that. I'd say I'm, I'm more naturally an equalitarian and Eric is more sort of fairness. And, and the distinction between that, you know, you can do the equality of outcome versus equality of opportunity thing. That might work as well. I mean, to me, it's fine to talk about equality of opportunity, but ultimately you have to see that the opportunities you're setting up do produce the outcomes you want. Otherwise, it's a, just a bit of a house of cards. So, you know, I, I tend to focus more on the outcomes generated, if you want to put it that way. Makes sense. Um, moving into a little bit of the details of, of uh, some of the proposals, Christopher Garrity asks, excuse me if this is an answer I should know, no apology needed, uh, Christopher, because I'm interested in the answer too. Uh, how is the proposed sovereign wealth fund different from the social, social security trust fund? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, well, the first one is you're not buying bonds and you're certainly not buying U.S. government bonds. Not that they're bad, they're still the global reserve asset, but you're trying to pick up equities because equities have this kind of long-term premium at 6%, which is kind of awesome when you consider the growth rates on average are around 2%. So the reason that rich get rich, this is Piketty's point, R is greater than G, the rate of return on assets greater than the, gro greater than the rate of growth in the, government, in the economy. So Piketty's solution is tax capital at 80%. Well, that's never going to happen. My solution is flip it around. Why can't we all get a bit of R rather than worrying about who's getting diminishing slices of G? And that's basically why it's equity based. If I can jump in, there was another question that I just saw up here that I want to address, which is, where did it go? This is from Seth of the Chocobo. What a fantastic name. Wouldn't the state-run wealth fund not create incentives for politicians to turbocharge predator capitalism in order to hike up the assets in the wealth fund, making politicians at the bankers? You could if you designed it really badly, but you can also design it as a completely passive fund that basically buys Abu Dhabi style 0.25% of everything, that has a completely independent board, that has nothing to do with any electoral cycle, and then is mandated to disperse in certain ways, so you just keep them away from it. That's more a design question than a, an intrinsic political economy question, I think. And, and presumably, though, that wealth fund can invest in a bunch of domestic companies. One could you know, imagine an equity position in uh, Apple or, or, or whomever else, right? Yeah, exactly. But another one that we talk about, and this is our angle into sort of UBI, universal basic, basic income issues, is um, if you think about the, the, the stock market just now, it's the fans, Facebook, Apple, all the rest of it. There's 20% of the stock market. They're the ones that are growing. Everybody else is in the tail. Now, how do they make money? Well, they do it because we're using this platform. They do it because every keystroke is data and data becomes something that you can sell. Now, why are we giving it up for free? I mean, shouldn't we have a data dividend? All right, because if that's worth 20% of the stock market, we are actually the fuel for those profit engines. If we were talking to Sprint or T-Mobile, which Sprint still exists, it doesn't, but if we were talking to T-Mobile and they wanted a 5G, we'd say, yeah, sure, we'll sell you this bit of the spectrum. It's a 15-year lease. It's going to cost you X billion. 
So when it comes to individuals, Facebook, billions of dollars are worth because you just keep giving them the fuel. So why don't we license our data and that way we get a stake in these firms that is equivalent to an equity stake because we're giving them something that they use for their investment, but it's our asset. It's actually your information. So that's a pure asset-based response to the inequalities that these firms generate that gives us part of the upside that we get because they make so much money. You know, on the data dividend, I, I think there is a, a different kind of perspective. It's the sort of the Shoshana Zuboff surveillance capitalism argument that says there's just something fundamentally wrong and intrusive about companies whichever, whether it's Amazon or Facebook or Google, yeah. not just accessing our personal information, but weaponizing it, using this personal information to understand our deepest, most emotions and then manipulating us. Yes. And if one agrees with that argument, no need for you to agree, but if one agrees, one could say that it's just, it's inappropriate to put people in the position of selling this and legitimizing this kind of corporate access to one's personal data. It would be like saying you can sell yourself into slavery. Well, if you choose to do it, it's here, we'll give you some money. So I, I have to admit, I was a little uncomfortable with the, the data dividend proposal. Well, but the, what's the alternative? You're not going to nationalize these firms, right? That's not going to happen. You're not going to shut them down. Right? That's not going to happen. You're not going to blow up 20% of the stock market. So you might as well take a stake. One way yeah, you could well, take a stake is you could buy their equities, which are super expensive just now, or you could basically make sure that what they use as their profit engines are. Now, again, there's, there's an element in this in which, you know, I, I, one of my more liberal moments is this. Uh, Eric and I disagree on this one. I'm actually much more on the surveillance capitalism side, right? I would like much more sort of regulation of this stuff. But yeah, I was going to say regulation is the answer. Well, maybe, who knows? But I think ownership is better than regulation. But anyway, the way that Eric thinks about this is he doesn't care. He, he literally doesn't care. You can know whatever you want about me. Monetize the hell out of it. I love the convenience factor, right? Mm -hmm. You give me things in return that I deeply value. And that's great. I'm willing to give you my data. If people are willing to make that trade-off, unless you're going to shut them down, the counterfactual is untenable. You're doing it anyway. You might as well get some money for it. Yeah. Let's turn to a slightly different angle. Uh, Toby Dawes asks um, whether... Could national infrastructure projects be used to restart economies of countries by you know, investing in things like railways and, and or, or energy or whichever, whichever infrastructure target? Yeah, absolutely. And you could use the profits from a sovereign, from a citizen's wealth fund to actually help you do this, which would be good. I'm not against other reform proposals. Let me give a shout out for another book. If you want the really technical version of this with far more detail and far more proposals, have a look at Martin Sanbu's The Economics of Belonging. Right? The, the back end of that book is incredible. It's UBI, net wealth taxes, you name it, it's in there and he costs it and it's all fabulous, right? But uh, to think about infrastructure, let's put this in a COVID moment, right? Everybody loved mass transportation. What about now? Right? What about trains? Are you confident getting back on a train just now? What happens if, as we continue to destroy our nat natural infrastructure, that you get more animal to human viral transmissions, and this becomes something that we have to deal with much more frequently? Then it's not clear that sort of, you know, the we love tra public transport thing becomes as tenable as it once was, even though I'm a huge fan of it, don't get me wrong. What can we do? Well, you know, in the United States, I, I believe a third, if not more, of all carbon emissions come from buildings because we build badly. If you want to retool an entire workforce, turning them into ele electrical uh, and HVAC engineers and retrofit in every building in the United States would probably cost less than the Fed has guaranteed in financial assets over the past three months. Fed hasn't spent it, they've only guaranteed it, they're buying stuff that they're going to put on their balance sheet, let's be clear. But at the same time, what we've shown in this crisis, everywhere except the United States, is that you really can't just basically pay 80% of wages for an indefinite period and lock down the economy. Britain's done it, Denmark did it, Australia did it. Everybody was able to, Canada did a version of this. Everybody was able to do this. And what that tells us is that the financial and fiscal constraints on doing those types of investment is way less than we had hitherto thought. If you told me six months ago that Boris Johnson, right, the posh man's Trump, would be doing what we call helicopter money to save the British economy rather than trying another round of quantitative easing, I would have given you very long odds. Yet that's exactly what he's done. And in doing so, he's shown that the scope for that type of work, that type of investment is far bigger than we thought.
you know, this uh, moving to a, a, a different question, a more philosophical one, Chris Harding asks, um, he says he's not sure whether we can fix uh, this with policy or these problems we're discussing with policy um, if we don't do the hard work of articulating some kind of shared philosophy about what business is really for in, you know, in life and society. And I guess that yeah. touches a little bit about my earlier question about solidarity. I mean, how do, do we need a new philosophy that can motivate people? And if so, what and how? The $64,000 question. So in a way, my challenge is this. I, I, I think that what's really held back reformist politics in the past decade is this idea that you fix things with policies. The, there's a problem. We have a policy. We have an RCT score. That's the one that yeah. uses. So we have this. We have this list of policies. That's what you saw in, in both the Clinton campaign and also the Warren campaign. And it doesn't sum to a politics. But the problem the other way is, well, what do you mean by that? So people say, well, you need some kind of project, things that people can believe in, et cetera. Absolutely. But if we think about the successful reformist projects of the 20th century, it's not as if, you know, the, the social Democrats in Sweden came out with a giant plan with multimedia, trying to get people invested in things. They basically said, look, it's very simple. Survival and fairness. That's it. That's all we're asking for. And here are some things that we need to do to our economy to ensure that those outcomes become kind of normalized for everyone. That's relatively uncontroversial. I think we sort of bid up too much, either by making it infinitely technical in a list of endless policies that no one understands, or looking for some kind of transformative grand narrative, think Green New Deal, which unfortunately alienates half the people that you're trying to get on board. Yeah. So the simpler one is like, why not just do stuff that is relatively uncontroversial and makes a big difference, and then build on top of that? I agree. It, 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 is the, it, is, it is the $64,000 question. I'm looking for that new philosophy. Uh, there are a few different questions about the EU and the Euro, but let me, let me um, uh, go with this one from is it Stefan Kassin. Is there really any alternative to the Euro? Um, you know, our 19 floating currencies, is, is that a mad idea? And I, I guess I would add, what about the EU in general? I mean, right. what's the future of the Euro and, and the EU? So the EU in a way is the most likely place for some of these things to be tried. And in fact, they're already doing it. So dual interest rates, check, right? Helicopters, yeah. check, right? They're doing this stuff. Sovereign wealth funds already getting quietly looked at in certain places. Because in a sense, take Germany, for example, they need to manage the decarbonization slash green transition. And they make diesel. That's what they do. They need to have yeah. some kind of fund to bridge the transition from there to there. So why not use a vehicle like this? It's like a, a special investment vehicle for the whole economy, if you want to put it that way. So, so those things are there. On the euro itself, I mean, the, the downside criticism, it's, it's the Hotel California. You can check in, but you can't check out without effectively destroying half your savings as capital flight in the eurozone, etc. if you try and get out. But I think that events have moved us to a different position now. And the recent Franco-German proposal, which has been fought by the so-called Frugal Four, et cetera, shows that the writing's on the wall for the sort of North tells the South what to do, right? Here's why. Essentially, you've got a couple of things that happened last year. The China, China turned around and said to Germany, if you, don't, if you shut out Huawei, we're going to stop buying your cars. And the Germans went, oh, hang on, right? And now you've got, particularly if Trump wins, America that will tariff the hell out of Europe over Nord Stream 2, over cars. They just said that because we are the people who own all the digital uh, companies around the world that aren't paying taxes, we don't care anymore about taxing them. They just pulled out of any talks regarding this. So the world is moving into these three spheres. And Europe basically can no longer pretend to be this apolitical place that doesn't have its own debt instrument, that doesn't have um, a euro, which is a truly internationalized currency. It is per capita the wealthiest part of the world. It is just politically disunified. And what's gonna drive this isn't sort of a new technocratic, let's bring Europe together. It's gonna be sort of a recognition amongst those states that it is in their interest to mutualize not just their debt, but their assets. Because if they don't, they're going to be caught in this increasingly fractious world between the United States and China. And that's not a good place to be, particularly if you're dependent on selling them stuff as your business model. So I think that Europe really begins to see now that they need to turn the euro from an asset into a liability. 
and there are baby steps towards not going in that direction. Is that possible, Mark, without a strong European identity among individuals, among you know, the, 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 the citizenry of these various countries? Well, you know, think about the American experience. It's born in revolution. They try and have a central bank. They abolish it because they think it's overreach. They then have tons of currencies and local currencies and banking crisis and the total mess in the, in the 19th century. It's only civil war that brings about the greenback and you don't get a central bank until 40 years later. So Europe reversed the process. Let's start with the currency and the central bank. Then we'll see how far we get with the other stuff. Now, the other stuff, the political and fiscal agenda has been in abeyance for years. It's difficult, no one's denying that. But the alternative is either fractionalization and a massive disruption of wealth, which nobody wants to see, or you make a place that has a lot of assets going for it into something more than it is. And I think that what we see now, particularly with France and Germany, is a recognition that that's the path, that, whether or not they like it, that's the path they're going to have to take their electorates down. And, and you feel the electorate buys that position as much as not, experts? Not yet. Um, yeah. Basically, you know, the, the weaponization, the populist moment is very much where we are. But there's no solution in national populism for these types of questions. Right. So essentially, right. you can try it, but it'll fail. And then you get back to something else. And, and you end up with a lot of value destruction. Yeah, well, but you also, but, the virtue of not being able to get out of the euro is the fact that populists can't destroy it without destroying themselves. And if they destroy themselves, then yeah, then you move on. Yeah, although sometimes I wonder, given the kind of nihilistic moment we're arguably in, there may be a certain passion of self-destruction, at least among some political leaders. Well, well, here's what could do this. I mean, the fastest growing party in the polls in Italy is the Fratelli d'Italia, right? So forget the, the league. These guys are actual fascists, right? Now, they might do something crazy like bring in a new leader and all that sort of stuff if they ever came to power. What would make them come to power would be the EU saying, okay, Italy, I know that you haven't grown in 20 years. I know your debt's blown out from 120 to 160% of GDP. I know you've got an 8% deficit because of COVID and you've got this terrible old population and you haven't grown all that. Now tighten your belts. If you do an austerity binge on Italy at this point, those guys win. But you know what? I think that Europe knows that. Yeah. We just have a couple more minutes, so we'll try to get a, a, just a last few sure. questions in. Um, there's a, a question from Chris Gong about climate change. So um, Chris asks, do you, do you, Mark, think there could be bipartisan support for climate change if and when it's framed as a national security question? Is there some way to get support for, for climate change remediation? Where are the biggest solar farms in the United States? They're already in Texas. Brown buys its electricity from them. Where are the wind farms? They're in the heartland, in the Republican heartland. What is a problem, and this goes back to our discussion of technocrats telling people what to do and all the rest of it, is a bunch of people driving around in Priuses on the East Coast lecturing that this is a moral problem and these people are wrong for living in a carbon economy. It, the transition's already happening. At the end of the day, coal is defunct. Take a British example. Britain hasn't actually generated any electricity from coal for, I think, three months. And they have no intention of switching it back on unless they absolutely have to. So that transition is already happening. The problem is that we're ne needlessly politicizing it by turning it into a moral crusade of those who are on the right side versus the wrong side of the carbon transition. I think that's what the real damage is. There's a, a lot more to say, but because time is short, let's go to at least one more. You know, we didn't talk a lot about technology and demographics, which is you have really interesting discussions in the book. But um, Darren Sweeney asks, to what degree does UBI, Universal Basic Income, provide Silicon Valley with a furtive method of replacing workers with automation? You're talking my language. I've been deeply suspicious of UBI for a long time precisely because of this. You should always think about who's proposing an idea. If the people making the robots are telling you, wouldn't it be great if you're redundant, you should probably be suspicious. I also don't buy the end of work stuff, but in conversations, sometimes very heated with UBI advocates, I've come to realize that in fact, that you know, these are not necessary conditions of this. Essentially what we're talking about with UBI, if it's done properly, and Spain has just introduced one, is kind of much minimum wage plus. Rather than it being a politically contested minimum, it basically becomes a citizen's income. And once you do that, you force unproductive labor-intensive jobs out. You force businesses to invest more in capital. 
that leads to a shift in the composition of employment. But if basically income goes up, there's no reason for that to change the absolute amount of employment the wealth is generated. In fact, it should be positive. That version goes back to Hyman Minsky in the version of the employer, the, the state is the employer of last resort. There are lots of ways of doing UBI that are not the Silicon Valley version. And that's the ones that I think are interesting. And I guess to, to some extent, the issue isn't isn't whether you know the total amount of jobs will be destroyed but i think the issue is the nature of those jobs could very well change and we, we're seeing them change and what does that transition look like not so much you know what are we going to do with all this free time that we have or all these jobs that have been destroyed but, but what is that how is that dislocation and uh, handled and even intergenerationally absolutely so maybe time for one last question um and it's a it's one that shows up in among several different audience members, how bad is the recession going to be that we're in? I mean, are we looking at another Great Depression? Is it just uh, something short of that? How bad are things going to be in the next few years? Nobody knows. Let's be perfectly honest, because we haven't lived that future yet. And the wonderful thing about the way that we think about the economy, or at least I think about the economy, some of us think about the economy, is the key, I'll bring in Keynes for the third time. His key insight for me was the following. How you think about the future determines your present. If you think the next three years are gonna be awful, you'll probably not do any investments now which makes the future guaranteed to be awful. It's always these sort of socially contingent expectations of the future. But there are real structural things and there's an open case as to whether the way the United States has treated the crisis, basically well, allowing people to become unemployed it's actually better in the long run with all of the costs that the United States never covers in the sense that you're not trying to preserve jobs which COVID has now destroyed. That there will be a redeployment of capital and labor markets will adjust. And net on net, the United States is better because it didn't do the furloughs, right? That's a plausible argument. But here's another plausible argument. By building much bigger airbags and not doing that, European economies are able to control the virus and maintain those industries and jobs that we have. We just don't know yet how that's going to play out. And anyone who tells you they do is basically selling their book. Right. And among, say, citizens or you know, the electorate, I think one of your points is, well, it depends on what their age is. You know, their notion of the future is going to be contingent on how old they are and oh, how long absolutely. that future is. And I think that's just, it's underscored so critically um, throughout the dialogues. Well, Mark Blythe, I want to thank you for this great conversation. I want to thank both you and Eric Lonergan for a really terrific book. And lastly, I want to thank the audience for your great questions. I mean, these are really challenging times, but this kind of conversation, um, I find not just really enriching, but it provides some cause for optimism that people are thinking creative, uh, creatively and thinking about very different kinds of solutions from what we've seen in the past. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Great dialogue. Thank you.